I'm Abby Kinney, and you are listening to UpZoned. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of UpZoned, a show where we take a big story from the news each week that touches the Strong Towns conversation, and we UpZone it. We talk about it in depth. I'm Abby Kinney, an urban planner in Kansas City, and joining me today is another Kansas Cityan, my friend Kevin Klinkenberg, architect, planner, and executive director of Midtown KC Now. Uh, So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Sarah, for having me again, Abby. Pleasure to be here. Well, I uh, called you because the the, the article that we are covering today I think needs an architect, (laughs) even if we are not experts on building code. Um, This is another article that is specifically about building code that I thought was really interesting. Um, It was published in Architects newspaper by Michael, I think it's Elazon, and it is entitled Why American Multifamily Architecture Looks So Banal. Here's one reason. So for years, I think, in the planning, urban design, architecture world, we have limited the blandness of modern multifamily architecture where new construction is occurring. I think a lot of people are familiar with these buildings that are popping up that are three to seven stories, uh, apartment mixed-use buildings with large first-floor parking garages and kind of blocky architectural features, large expanses of usually cement and stucco and metal and maybe some brick veneer if we're lucky. Uh, The article of, or the writer of this article is actually an architect who has worked in the US and Europe and explains that the root cause of this architecture is actually pretty simple and that it's the stairs. So, In the U.S. and Canada, specifically, our codes require multifamily buildings to include a second staircase with a connecting corridor for a building with more than three stories. So this is a double loaded corridor format that is much more like a hotel plan than a traditional housing plan that you would see in other parts of the world. In fact, this is actually very rare to see in Europe, and European apartment buildings have what they call point access blocks, which are is basically a format where you have a, a compact single staircase, um, and the units are centered around that one uh, staircase and elevator core. And in most places in the U.S., this format is not allowed in buildings uh, that are over three stories. So buildings with more floors or more than four units per floor require a second stairway and corridor. So to make projects viable, developers basically need to have this large lot size and double loaded corridor building. So apparently that's why we see them popping up all over the place. Um, While the author recognizes that Uh, Changing our codes to allow these point access blocks aren't necessarily a silver bullet to all things housing in the United States and and across America more generally. This would unlock a lot of benefits that I think we should talk about today. I actually spent a lot of time just looking at apartment buildings (laughs) throughout (laughs) Europe and, and looking at the differences with how they're laid out. And it, it seems that this, this point block uh, structure lends itself really well to courtyard apartment buildings, more smaller and medium sized lots, which um, I think is really valuable. It's the type of building that I think a lot of people would like to see in our multi-fa- multifamily construction. Yet it, there are so many reasons why it's challenging to build these new. And apparently our building building codes are a huge part of that. Um, so so yeah, I think I I kind of want to talk about building codes generally, and I think the focus is often on zoning, and zoning is a big part of of the reforming or reforming how we build in this country and across the continent, but. It, this almost makes me want to do a deep dive specifically on <laughs> building codes, which is something that I am not a, an expert on uh, by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> yeah, well, watch out. It's it's crazy <laughs> once you 
<laughs> once you start diving deep into uh, building codes. I actually thought this was a really interesting piece, and it's kind of a good companion to your episode last week where you talked about the uh, cowboy hotels and exactly. that phenomenon, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, you know, essentially it's taking a longer look at why things are the way they are uh, and what are the what are the various impacts that create our built environment. And uh, I, I think you all had a great discussion last week about the nature of uh, finance mm-hmm. and how uh, how finance impacts uh, the built environment. Um, there, you know, there's the old uh, Louis Sullivan saying that was form follows function, which um, y- you know developers tend to say form follows finance. Uh, and so I think there's a, a really important element to why we see the buildings that we do because they're trying to create standardized. Uh, financial products that they can sell on the secondary market. So I think that discussion last week with Chuck was really, really good in that respect and in talking about these. And now this kind of gets into some of the design and building aspects as well. uh, And, and why we, uh, why we see a lot of the double loaded corridor buildings. So there's a lot in here that I think he really nailed. That was fascinating. Um, When I was, when I was a young architect and I was, uh, doing architecture all day long every day. I used to actually really love getting to know the building codes and diving deep into them, uh, like you say, and really it, it, it's kind of like a puzzle in a lot of ways. And and you really were trying to solve a problem by figuring out which of like five or six different variables you needed to, uh, to solve for uh, in order to create the building that you were working on. And there's, it, there's, a lot of variables we're looking at. You know, it's interesting. When I started um, practicing architecture, uh, there were actually three major building codes that we had to know about, depending on uh, de- really depending on where you were practicing in the country. Uh, so they were the, there was the Boca Code, the the UBC, which was the Uniform Building Code, and there was the Southern Building Code. And eventually, those all merged into the International Building Code, which is what we have today. And uh, which was, you know, from a designer standpoint, that was helpful because then you just really had one code uh, to look at. But it also did standardize a lot of design elements across codes. Um, And they really did used to have very different uh, approaches and interpretations that were kind of interesting. But the big uh, the big change that he really alludes to in this in this piece was that with the creation of the International Building Code, it was really pushing architects and construct and construction companies to uh, really emphasize the use of sprinklers to mm-hmm. solve fire issues. Um, so, uh, you know, this is kind of a tangent, but when we talk about building codes, that's kind of interchangeable with what lay people call fire codes. Uh, it, so you'll hear people talk about fire codes, but what they're almost always talking about really are building codes that cities adopt that regulates cities and states adopt that regulate the practice of, of building and design. So what happened when the IBC came around was it really pushed everybody to use sprinklers on most building types other than like single family homes and duplexes and then gave designers much more broad allowance on what they could or couldn't do with those types. And so he really you know, I think he did a great job of explaining how, you know, a lot of the structure of our codes is based on thinking from 70, 80, 90 years ago, uh, before we had modern sprinkler systems, modern uh, fire alarms, uh, and, and other, uh, some of the other construction methods we have today that really are just incredibly superior into fighting a fire when something happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, it, and, but we still really wrestle with these egress or exiting requirements that push the, the need for, uh, these double loaded corridor buildings or just multiple exits, even from, even from smaller buildings, just having, you know, multiple stairway, uh, exits. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it kind of makes you think that there are, I mean, of course, fire is terrifying. Nobody wants to be at risk of dying in a fire or, um, you know, their building being burned down. But it does seem like there is this, it, it's almost like an overkill of caution where we're layering things despite um Despite changes in the industry, changes in material, 
And once you put things in code, it, it seems that it's very hard for codes to adapt. It takes mm -hmm. an, an enormous lift. And I say that just thinking of, of zoning, which it you know doesn't have to do necessarily with life safety issues and life safety issues are very hard to make an argument against um, and actually change codes for. And one of the quotes from the article actually talks about Switzerland and and how you know fire doesn't burn different differently in the U.S. than it does in Switzerland, but Switzerland is a country with the lowest fire death rate in the world, where unsprinklered single stair high rises are actually legal. So that you know this may be more of a building code, or, or it goes beyond the building code. Um, why? Yeah fires occur and um, whether we are at a great threat and thinking of just the planning uh, aspect of life safety and, and fire, I, I think we're all familiar with, you know, fire departments kind of demanding roads to be wider. And it, it seems like there's um, this, this relationship between just, the expansion of our world, not just these double loaded large scale buildings, but also making streets wider, um, spreading things out <laughs> as much as possible. It, it's really contradictory to having compact walkable places and small scale and mid scale buildings. And, and I'm not sure how you, um, I, I guess it's it's again it's hard it's hard to make an argument against life safety when it's such a complicated kind of kind of issue yeah but there i i think you hit on something that's important there and there, there's there's a lot of analogies obviously to zoning and and transportation when you start looking at the building code there's obviously a tremendous desire on the part of everybody to reduce risk and to increase safety or at least perceived safety. Mm -hmm. There is a huge desire on the part of municipalities to try to uh, reduce risk uh, and liability and building owners uh, as well. So there's, you know, everybody, everybody involved is trying to limit liability in case something bad were to happen. And every, just like in a zoning code, you know, every single line in a zoning code is there because there was a project that did something that people didn't like. And so, uh, you know, an, an ordinance was built around that. Every single item in the building code is there for a good reason, because there was probably a fatality that yeah. happened. Uh, and, you know, there are there are so many really minute aspects to it. Uh, you know, there are uh, one of the aspects of the codes that I just remember having beat into me as a young architect. But, you know, the 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 vertical rails on like a, a, a railing for a stairway or a balcony, um, they, they can only be, I think it is about four inches on center uh, maximum uh, uh, apart from each other. And that's basically because it's the size of a child's head. And, and so that was given because, you know, obviously at some point a child fell through uh, a railing or a balcony and died. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, we modified the building code uh, to account for those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And the egress issues in buildings are exactly the same way, especially when you have what we call type five buildings or wood frame buildings. W whenever you have wood frame buildings, they can in fact uh, go up in flames uh, really quickly. Uh, and if there isn't a fire suppression system, um, you, can, you can have some, a really tragic uh, event happen in very short order in, you know, in a wood frame building. And so that really pushed the needs for uh, the multiple exits, shorter, uh, shorter distance to exits, and just lots of redundancy to be able to get people out uh, of a bad situation. And so it, you know, it's just like with zoning, it's really hard to argue against any one of those things. Right. It's always, it's always the cumulative aspect that then becomes a problem because every, every item in the building code, is there for good reason. But when you add them all up together, that's when you really start to, to see, you know, is this overkill? And I think most architects who practice for a while and work with the codes, I think we recognize there's a lot of overkill in the building codes and a lot of 
there's probably a lot of things that we do that are just really overdoing it and we could probably eliminate some aspect of them but uh, but at the end of the day you have to comply with the building codes to get your permits and so that's what you're going to do yeah and and then and then if you can't get your permits and you can't build the building you can't uh, you know you can't finance it um, you can't occupy it uh, any of those things so there there's a lot of relationship between how those uh, codes come into being and because there's really one code now that we're all working towards uh, it you're right it does make it uh, really hard there, there's quite a process that's involved with changing um, uh, any of the basics of the IBC itself well <sighs> So one, one of the things that I was wondering about is whether the IBC actually is international <laughs> based on the discussion in this article talking about how other places in Europe are building a completely mm -hmm. different way. I'm sure across, across the world, there are different building practices happening, resulting in different outcomes. And, you know, of course, it, it, form follows finance, but really what is financeable, which has everything to do with codes and regulations and uh, materials and costs. So uh, that I guess that's one of the clarifications I, I would like to touch mm -hmm. on is whether or not IBC actually is international and how that impacts maybe how people are building in other countries. Yeah. It, it is international. Uh, it is certainly used in many countries around the world. I think ultimately the desire on the part of when the code organizations merged was to really make this a truly international standard. Mm -hmm. uh, now, is it used everywhere in the world? No, absolutely not. And it's, I think it's modified by a number of countries. I haven't done a building overseas, so I don't know how that works in a lot of other countries. I'm sure there are some people who could comment, you know, on the podcast and give us their experience about working with codes in other countries. Uh, but uh, that certainly was always the intent behind the IBC was to really make it a truly international approach to um, to building new buildings. Yeah. Yeah. And really, I think... Um this discussion about blandness and, uh, you know, I, I think everybody can kind of picture the types of buildings that we're talking about and they truly are a lot like hotels. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, you yeah. know, but. I, and I, I think the author made, he made some great points in there about the advantages of the single stair uh, building, yeah. uh, the walk up yeah. building. And, you know, I think a lot about that because, you know, you, you talked on the, last episode about the colonnades that we have here in Kansas City, these, you know, four or six plex buildings that are really common, three story, often three story uh, buildings. Uh, and they really are incredibly livable. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons they're livable and they, they are single stair buildings. Uh, one of the reasons they're livable is because the units do go front to back, just like uh, the author mentioned. So you get light on two sides on every unit. Uh, they are just, you know, for a, uh, for a one or a two bedroom apartment, whatever size they might be, they're just really wonderful units to live in that are uh, just so much nicer than the typical double loaded corridor apartment building. And so if you can hack the code in the manner that he described, um, I think that's wonderful, and it's a, it is a huge livability uh, advantage for uh, for people in those buildings, and for creating the kinds of missing middle buildings that we talk about a lot. Yeah, exactly, because the the blandness really does come from I think just having large scale buildings. The larger scale the building is going to be, the more I mean. It, you're not going to have a very dynamic neighborhoods made up of that scale, um, no matter really what you do to the facade of the building, whether you try to articulate it vertically or change materials in some way. Um, and this has this discussion has really it really really made it occur to me that both codes and finance causes this physical manifestation, but it also has significant implications for who actually contributes to the built environment and property development. It, 
it really does shut off small to mid-sized builders and favors really uh, our codes and our finance structures favor either very large scale development or um, single family homeowners. Those are the two, the two things from a, um, from a finance, from a zoning, and I suppose from a building code perspective that are easiest to build. And so that's what we're going to get. And it, I mean, it quite literally creates, you know, what people call the missing middle and it's the missing middle of not just building types, but missing middle of levels of investment, missing middle of how our economy works. Uh, it's like the missing middle class, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, it, um, I think you're right in the sense that, so one thing that people don't often know about, like on the building codes, is there's there's the inter- international building code that we've talked about a lot. There's also the international residential code, the IRC. Mm-hmm. The IRC is effectively for one and two family buildings, so single family houses, townhomes, and duplexes. So there has, and this is this has been in place for years. There's been an enormous code advantage in sticking with the IRC. It's much more flexible, it's cheaper, it's easier to use, it's all wood frame construction. Um, You just have a lot less that you have to deal with when trying to figure out how to design and build your building. And so that does push a lot of construction to one and two family. And in most jurisdictions, when you start to get like a three family or a triplex, then you hit the commercial code, the IBC, mm. and a lot of other requirements start to kick in. Um, now, I, I do understand that cities can modify that at their discretion. They can, you know, there have been, there's been some interest in recent years about cities making uh, fourplexes and under the, the breakdown for the IRC, which would be a big help. And that would align with the financing mechanisms, which allows people to buy up to a fourplex uh through a standard mortgage. Um, but right now it, it's kind of crazy when you start to like layer the matrix of how all these codes and financing mechanisms work or don't work together. Uh, it, it's really an interesting challenge, especially for small developers. And so the easiest thing uh, is, is to try to find, you know, the hacks that, that work within the, uh, the codes that, uh, you know, get the building that get a building built that you can afford. Uh, And that's often been sticking with one and two family Mm -hmm. as opposed to working up from that. Uh, But historically, obviously we didn't have that consideration and we didn't have any of these codes really in place when all those colonnades and other buildings were built uh, that, that we admire today. Yeah. And the fact that they, I mean, they exist, I wonder how much of an actual fire hazard they are. Um, I mean, you would think that our, all of Midtown Kansas City would have been burned down by now. <laughs> um, and that's not to make light of, you know, people, but, you know, people's buildings burning down, which is horrible. But uh, the layer of regulation associated with the built environment certainly has an impact. And I think sometimes we need to step back and ask ourselves what we're trying to accomplish, what kinds of places we're trying to actually build. And I guess the, the more consolidated standards become, the more difficult it is to actually change them. Um, Although it does seem according to this article that there are efforts in Canada and on the West coast of the United States to address some of these changes at the state level. Yeah, I was interested to see that in Seattle, uh, where he does, a, I guess, a, some of his work, that they modified that to allow um, up to is it five or six stories that could be used with the single single stair. Uh, and, and, and so that's really cool. I'd be interested in their approach. I, I imagine they've probably had great success with that. And, uh, you know, one of the other funny things about all this is that while we have gotten stricter and stricter in terms of fire suppression, you know, uh, and good, good design to limit the damage potentially of fires. We also spend an enormous amount of money on fire departments uh, <laughs> and, you know, and a lot of effort for fire departments, you know, to make sure our roads are a certain width mm-hmm. uh, to accommodate 
the fantastic vehicles they have and, you know, and they do a great job and our fire department here does a great job and they, they react to emergencies very quickly. Yeah. Uh, but it it's also, that's also part of the puzzle, which is, you know, how quickly can they access an emergency if they need to and how effective are they? And most modern fire departments are really effective, you know, once they get a call at getting there pretty quickly and, and acting. And uh, it, it seems like uh, that's another part of the, of the, the Jenga uh, game about how this all works together uh, that we don't, uh, we don't talk about very much. Yeah. I, I mean, everybody loves firefighters, of course, but the firefighting industrial complex <laughs> is having a significant <laughs> impact on the uh, physical makeup of public and private spaces, right? Yeah. In fact, I, I have a friend who's working on a, a on a little six unit cottage court in a jurisdiction in our region that will go unnamed, uh, where the fire department just told him the driveways uh, need to be twenty feet wide for fire truck access. Yeah. For uh, yeah. You know, something that is just a standard residential depth uh, on the lot. And so we're still, this is still a battle we're fighting uh, all the time. Uh, you know, I, we think about this a lot, even, even when we talk about single family houses and development of single family houses. One of the things that I have um, tried to incorporate over the years when we write zoning codes is to make sure the zoning codes align with the building code. Mm -hmm. Because you'll often, you'll often see, setback requirements in zoning codes that don't necessarily match what the building code does. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, historically you might have houses that are three or four feet away from each other across property lines. Uh, but nowadays you're realistically not going to do that because of the uh, requirements to fire rate the exterior walls and, and windows and everything. And so there are just, there are just other you know, there are other requirements that, that come into play that um, need to be thought about when we're, when we're doing uh, zoning regulations as well. That's something, uh, so now we are, we seem to be in this zoning reform movement that has kind of hit popularity, even at the federal level. I would love to see both of these code movements merge together to, you know, have a comprehensive rethink about how these things work together and what manifests out of that physically and financially. Yeah. And I think honestly, the best way, the best way to do that is for people at the local level to, to put their heads together. So yeah. uh, in an ideal scenario, you would get together uh, developers and architects and engineers and city officials, fire department officials, you know, and, and all sit around the table and try to ask, you know, what, what are our common goals here? What are we really trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And and then really start to lay out all of the different pieces and, and really try to see what you could impact at the local level. And I think there really is a lot that people can do at the local level on these things. Uh, it would be, I think it's far easier and more effective for that to happen than to rely on a bigger systemic change from yeah. uh, the IBC or, or from, uh, you know, recommendation from the APA or somebody like that. So uh, I, I think, you know, people, and, and there are places that have done some of this, but uh, I think you're right. It's a good, it would be good to, it'd be fun to be part of an effort like that to say, let's all put our heads together and, and lay out all these codes and let's talk about where they conflict and where they, where they don't. And, uh, and if our goal is to really try to build more housing and build it more affordably for a lot of people, you know, how can we, how can we do a better job? Yeah. Yeah. Without compromising the, you know, the, the actual life safety or actual mm -hmm. design and finance issues, I think it would be great for communities yeah. to begin to think through these things. And I agree with you that when you have, several different local communities thinking through these issues, you may get several different approaches, which I think is a right. good thing because it gives us something to compare with one another. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's leave it there. I appreciate you coming on for this very technical discussion <laughs> on building code. <laughs> uh, it makes me want to do just a deep dive into the rabbit hole of building codes. Do, do my best. It's been a few years since I really had to work through all the 
details of uh, of the IBC, but yeah, uh, it, it's, an, it's an interesting you know hornet's nest to dig into. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe a hornet's nest is a good way of putting it. Um, <laughs> although I feel that way about zoning code sometimes too. <laughs> yeah, um, no, no kidding. Okay, so before we finish today, it is time for the down zone, which is the part of the show we can share anything that we have been up to these days, anything we've been reading, watching, listening to. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> what is your down zone? Well, uh, you know, we've had some, actually some really gorgeous early spring weather here lately. Uh, it's been kind of unseasonably warm and it's been sunny a lot. And so that's gotten me in the mood to work outside uh, and uh, and finally uh, get to work on, you know, the on the yard, on flower beds, on spring vegetable planting, all that stuff. So the last couple of weeks, I've really been excited to just dig into, you know, what's going on outside our house and, and try to get some things growing. I planted a whole bunch of stuff last fall that I'm curious to see now what's going to come up and some of it's starting to come up, which is cool. Uh, but it's just that time of year where I've just got a bug, you know, to really be outside and to just, you know, get some things growing and, and, get rid of all of the, the brown and, and uh, ugliness that you get from the, from the end of winter. <laughs> That's really funny. I have a very similar down zone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I call it my springtime mania, but yeah, once we start to get these 75 to, I think the other day it was in the mid eighties, which was yeah, amazing. Crazy. And I, um, I, I just started working. I have a deck that has been kind of falling apart um, since I bought the house. And so we've been kind of rebuilding that, got a bunch of lumber, which I'm very excited about. Um, so going to start staining that in the next couple of days. I've been staining, restaining a lot of my deck and just sanding down the metal railings that we have and having those repainted and going to repaint some of the wood. So we'll basically have a new deck in the next couple of months, um, which I'm really Fantastic. excited about. Hopefully less than a couple of months, but give us some flexibility. <laughs> it's a big job. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big job, but it's, a, you know, it's nice to having those outdoor spaces, uh, especially in a climate like this is just really nice. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not in a place that's warm uh, year round, but we still get, six to nine months when it's really nice to be outside yeah. and uh, i we have you know we have a nice deck on the back of our house and um that's been really a great addition now if we could just have something attractive to look at because the yard looks terrible so working on that <laughs> uh, i completely understand uh, our backyard is also a work in progress so <laughs> yes it's um it's coming along though that's that's kind of my next that's my next project is to make that look a little bit better than it did last year, which is really all yeah. we can hope for. <laughs> well, and it's kind of fun too, because, you know, you and I both do work where you don't always see the results of what you're doing for a long period of time. And so one of the things I really enjoy about stuff around the house is, you know, you can either fix something and it's right away it's fixed. Or if you're planting or growing something, you'll see, you know, usually within a few months you'll see results and it's it's very it's very exciting to have that sort of tangible uh, <laughs> that success i feel the same way i mean really there's nothing better uh than doing a home improvement project for me i don't know what it is about just painting something or fixing something up even even like fixing something under my sink and i i didn't grow really? up as a someone who knew how to do any of these things yeah. so um yeah i don't want to get the the wrong impression i i don't always youtube is my friend i'll just say that youtube is youtube is incredible for fixing stuff at home <laughs> yeah exactly but yeah there's there's nothing there's just nothing better than than fixing up the house and i'm really excited about actually having a deck that doesn't look terrifying to walk on and is repainted and restained, and um, our our old railings are definitely not um, 
not not to code as you were describing before, but the house was built in 1890, so we're going to have to take what we can get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, well, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for joining me, Kevin. I uh, appreciate you. you coming on and hope that we'll have an opportunity to have you back soon. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And thanks everyone for listening to another episode of UpZoned. Keep doing what you can to build a strong town.